Hello, everybody. The United States is facing an energy crisis that was brought on by the media as one of the prime culprits. Today is a very special guest, and we have a wild discussion. My name's Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group, and I've got a gentleman named Mark Masters. Mark is the CEO of Diamond Group, LLC, a national media broadcast television network radio podcasting strategic marketing firm with over 25 years of experience as a media CEO and over 35 years of experience in the media technology industries. Mark is a nationally recognized media thought leader and innovator who has advised top chief executives from Fox News channels, from founding CEO Roger uh, Alice, and former General Electric CEO Jack Welch, and a former United States president, to name a few. 1992, Mark studied building quality into the process under the still living legend quality control titan, Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Mark has successfully built and brought to national prominence seven of America's top 10 largest syndicated talk radio programs during his career. Mark also built and launched three all news only national radio networks, including Fox News Radio for the new Fox News Channel, advised the CEO of Fox News Channel on the launch of Fox Business Channel, became a joint partner in an international television production, which produced over five internationally recognized children's series. Uh, and scripted dramas in over 100 countries worldwide. Mark's business philosophy is inspired by his key mentor, Dr. Edwards Deming, and Mark's passion for innovation, quality, uh, profitability, and serving the underserved national audiences. This is huge because we're about to talk about some of those underserved markets. Mark, thank you so much for your time, and I really appreciate getting to visit with you. Well, thank you, Stu. I'm glad to be here. Great honor. I'll tell you, you and I have had the opportunity to chit-chat a couple times for a couple hours, and Mark, your vision for what is going on in the in, in energy market, the agricultural market, and the media market you're at the crossroads of three disastrous uh, topics that are coming across the, the, the world. So exactly. And, and, but this could only happen, Stu, in a country that was a post-liberal conservative debate society. Right. We, we, we live in a post-free speech America right now. And the reason I'm here with you today is to plead with the energy sector, 20 or 30 mid-sized CEOs from mid-sized energy companies to get together Right. And to and to re to the only way they're ever going to get a, f a fair shot with the U.S. media, it's never going to happen ever. The only way they're going to be able to help this country and help their own businesses is by, is be, by becoming the media. Unless the midsize oil and gas producers in this country become media savvy really fast, reframe the debate entirely, become heroes to the general public as they are. They are heroes to the general public. Right. We're going to continue seeing corporate communism evolve. Corporate communism is what we call ESG, okay? Right. Environmental, social, governmental. That is corporate communism in a different form. It's Marxist beliefs and systems. Yep. It's, it's uh, environmental religious beliefs encapsulated into uh, BlackRock's $10 trillion fund on, on who they will support and who they won't support. And if you are not in lockstep with the ESG belief, let's remove the term ESG and let's call it communist belief. Here's the communist belief system. If you don't, we, BlackRock won't buy your shares. You've done a lot of work with America's top opinion leaders, syndicated talk shows. Can you give us a little bit of history about why you feel America has been silenced so much in the past three years? Uh, I don't want to go through that whole list, but I built seven of the 10 biggest shows because I understand audiences and only about one out of a thousand local hosts can be syndicated because most radio hosts don't resonate with most audiences, but oh. some do. 
And the ones that do are speaking on behalf of their audience versus talking at them, right? So Rush yes. spoke on behalf of his audience and he sort of awakened his audiences to things they already knew. So in that sense, he became he, he became an emotional necessity for most people for their own sanity. He would right. build tension. He would build tension with making a point. He'd release that tension with humor, reset right. perspective. And when you listen to Rush, you feel like you're having emotional acupuncture, right? <laughs> you're laughing. He's making you feel like life is not, you know, such not so much drama. Right. I mean, don't, you know, don't 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 resent the other side. Help educate them. Uh, basically, because Rush is gone, in my opinion, because Rush is gone, right. there is no opposing voice that is that is sort of doing that right now for about 55 to 60 percent of the public, which shares the views right. on some level with Rush Limbaugh. People don't realize that about two thirds of Rush's audience were not conservatives. Right. Rush had not. about 50 million people in his audience, but but only about a third of those were conservative. The rest were independents and conservative blue dog Democrats. Uh, most talk wow. shows don't get audience because they're too conservative and they're not funny. They're not entertaining. They're not interesting. Russ used to tell me, he said, look, if I'm not entertaining, why listen to me? It doesn't matter what my viewpoints are. Right. But it's the entertaining nature. There's something about truth that makes things funny. Right. And I don't know if you've noticed. But the late night uh, comedians like Jimmy Kimmel and right. uh, and the others, they ceased to be funny when they started to become woke. Right. They, yes. Because because woke and funny don't mix <laughs> because woke is very prickly. And when the basis of good humor is right. irony, satire and the basis of irony and satire is there's a bit of truth in it. Right. Right. So if I'm... you remove if you remove the truth from humor. You don't have humor. You just have a talking mouth that defends wokeism. And even Bill Maher is frustrated with this now. Joe Rogan is frustrated with this. I woke up one morning to find out that Joe Rogan, uh, Russell Brand, Bill Maher were suddenly being called conservatives. I I, I don't know. Those guys aren't conservative. They no. just care about what's true, right? No, but I, I can guarantee you, Mark, with our discussion going on, we're going to have about six different T-shirts come out of this because I've already got one. Woke and humor are not in the same bed. I like there's more T-shirts coming along here. They, they don't they don't match. And one of the first things communists do, because uh, I, I was partners with a guy, one of the guys that worked on it was it was a top guy in, that made Lord of the Rings. And I was oh. one of my favorite movies, the, the series. And I went to New Zealand about 15, 18 18 years ago, and uh, just because I loved those movies, and I thought they were incredible yeah. entertainment products, honoring the, the great works of J.J. Tolkien. And uh, this fellow, wonderful man, uh, uh, you know, but he, he was, him and I had the same values. He was an atheist. I'm a Christian, right? But right. Uh, it's not something I advertised. In fact, I never, I never, he never even knew I was a Christian until I'd known him for nine years. We just had the same ethics. Right. But one thing he didn't understand, he said to me one day, he said, you know, he said, Mark, I'm not going to do a very good uh, New Zealand accent. He said, but he said, Mark, you know what? If it went for religion, there would have been no wars in the world. And I says, you know what? I'm not going to say his name because he's pretty famous. I said, you know what, blank? I said, you know how many people died uh, from all the religious wars in history? He says, no. He says, about 17 million in 6,000 years. When you actually add it all up, including the Crusades. Right. Wow. You know how many people died in the last 100 years because of communism? He says, well, how many? I says, well, Chinese killed 128 million. Russians only killed about 124 million. What's a few million between friends? Holy smokes. Communism, which is a godless system, right, turns out to be the most dangerous system to human life ever. In 100 years, communism has killed, through direct murder or starvation, wow. over 240 million people. And yet here it is in a new form called wokeism or 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 the uh, or what or another form called radical environmentalism it's taken a new form and its goal is to sabotage energy prices to right. start and if you can it, it, we have never experienced a world where there's a, an advanced society on expensive energy we don't know what that's like we've it never seen sustain. it it will not no. stay 
And the re and, and so the question people say to me, well, you know, they really want to care about the environment. I says, we all care about the environment. I don't know anybody that gets up in the morning and says, I wonder how it would make water dirtier today for kids. Nobody does that. Okay? No. We all care about the environment. And it used to be Republicans and Democrats used to go on TV shows. They both agreed clean air, clean water uh, at the 30,000 foot level. But at the five foot level, it was by what method, right? Uh, the, right. the Democrats wanted special regulations. The Republicans wanted to use the free enterprise system to make it more profitable, to make it more right. clean. We don't have that anymore. We have moved from a liberal Republican American system of debate to something different. And in the last five years, I don't know if you've noticed this, Stu, but I'm in the media business. OK. Yep. <laughs> and in the media business, in the media business, my, my friend Roger Ailes, who was I was the personal media advisor to Roger for the last 15 years of his life. And uh, wow. Roger called me to, to out of the blue to help to ask me to if he if I would build the, the radio division on the side for the Fox News Channel in 2002. And I I thought it was a joke. He cold called me out of the blue. It was out of the blue. I, I was a friends cold with call. Folks. He called me out of the blue. Uh, and I said <laughs> my secretary wow. said, uh there's somebody in the line named Roger Ailes for you. He's from Fox. And I said that I figured it was maybe Hannity because Hannity was a friend, Mac, just pulling a joke on me. We used to, you know, Matt Drudge and I, I knew all these guys. They all do voices. And <laughs> but I, I picked up the phone and I says, if this is Roger Ailes, tell me three reasons why I should believe it. And he told me the three reasons and it was really him. Uh, but but Roger, uh, Roger launched the Fox News Channel on the basis that half of his audience would be conservatives and half would be liberal. He wanted to get the vast middle that excluded the two or 3% of radicals on either the right or the left. And he wanted to serve a vastly underserved audience of about 55% of Americans that had no voice in television. Roger would turn over in his grave today if he would see Fox today, which it doesn't have any liberals on it. It's right. got paid professional guests. Uh, uh, they become niched and caricatures of themselves. But right. Roger knew that the largest audiences came when you had conservatives and liberals debating. When, when, but you need to understand what's happened in the last three years since the world has moved to the online space where suppression can, affer, can occur, like it, it does. We've now seen it occur with Twitter. Twitter. At a certain point, when, when the left moves from liberalism to leftism to Marxism, they can't win debates anymore in a free enterprise system. What do you do if you can't win a debate? You get nasty. You end, you end debate and you demonize the opposition. So we have a gaslighting scenario in, in America right now where 55 to 60 percent of the public is being told that being called hate uh, haters and racists. Uh, it, it turns out if you go to the gym, I, I just learned this from my son last week. There's articles that if you go to the gym to work to lift weights, you're a right winger. Really? I didn't know going to the gym was right wing. I didn't know Bill Maher was a, was a right winger. I didn't know Russell Brand was a right winger. I didn't know, Bill, you know, but all these people, I guess, are right because they're shifting their ship. The, the left who control the media, very broad control of the media. They're not the left anymore. We have totalitarian pro, uh, proto Marxism in control of our media and an active wow. suppression of speech period and that the, there's two enemies that the left have to eliminate and i believe it's the domestic energy producers they have to attack and destroy and they have right. to also attack and destroy the family farmer if you could do those things you have it and you have expensive food and expensive energy right. people can't pay attention to politics and the left doesn't want people to pay attention to politics this is the re you know, in, in, in think yeah. about this, Stu. In World War II, let, let's talk about let's really what talk about the media, what the yeah. media, what role the media plays, because unless the energy sector gets into the media business in a right. big serious way, right. we're all screwed. Exactly. We're all doomed. Because the media business dictates what is popular, what is not popular, what is good, and what is evil. And I was watching this interview from about four months ago. Andrew Ross Sorkin on CNBC was interviewing the CEO of Exxon. And his approach was this. Andrew Ross Sorkin says, D -d how do you sleep at night? This is, this is him talking to the CEO. I'll send you the clip. Okay. How do, you, how do you sleep at night? Aren't you like a big tobacco farmer, you know, where, where you give people cancer? Carbon is just killing the planet. 
he goes on and on making this guy. It's almost like you would think this guy was a slave owner. It, it's unbelievable. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, and he's a classy guy that, that the CEO of Chevron, he basically said, look, you, you don't understand. If we got rid of every single internal combustion transportation vehicle in the world, 75% right. of the world would still need petroleum. It wouldn't, it's right. only 25%. And then he goes on to explain that only 1% infrastructure exists for electric cars and electric systems in general. There's no consideration for the, the transition and how yeah. you know two or 3 million people don't have electricity yet. So they, they basically heat their homes using dung in many cases. Um, but it, but what, what it made me sit there and realize with my jaw hanging open is Andrew Ross Sorkin of CNBC, he's a reporter. 13, you know, 20 years ago, they would have not asked that assaulting question. Right. There is now a sentiment in general that energy, petroleum energy is in fact evil, right? And that you're going to melt yep. the, the ice caps. It's like the executives of energy go to the, you know, go to the snowy centers of the world with flamethrowers uh, with flamethrowers and they're just trying to burn our, 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 our snow caps down but here's what the problem is you don't have a political problem in the energy sector you do not have a legislation problem in the, in the energy sector you have a media problem because everything is downstream from media and sentiment right. and uh you know just in my opening comments and, and i don't know if you want to edit out the other part but my opening comments is this you know, Winston Churchill is one of my heroes. My father was an uh, uh, Englishman and a, a, a hero right. of World War II. Or not a hero of World War II. My father was a veteran in World War II. And and Churchill was the hero of World War II. But you, he because was a hero to you. He, he, he really was. Um, and essentially, Churchill, we later find out Churchill, in his memoirs, called World War II the unnecessary war. And as I, as I was reading deeper, Churchill goes on to talk about the founding father of BBC. Founding father of BBC hated Churchill because he was sympathetic to Hitler. Hitler was a socialist. People think of the Nazis. What is a Nazi? Well, it's a right winger. No, Nazi party sounds for the Socialist Party of Germany. It's the National Socialist Party. And hey. communism and socialism are very similar. Anyway, right. the founding father of BBC was very pro-socialist. And what people don't realize is that Churchill was banned from the BBC completely from 1934 until he became prime minister in 1940. And Hitler complained, I, sorry, and, and, and Churchill complained, had he right. had a voice, had he been able to debate on the BBC during that time, maybe World War II wouldn't have happened at all. Because That's when you look at the power of a bad press can start wars. Correct. And, and at the time, if you think about this, at the time, Hitler, basically Churchill was trying to warn the public about the dangers of Germany rearming itself in right. the face in the face of, of the agreements not to. And he had actually flown to the French to see the French to, to, to get them to reinforce their army. And the, the French told him, and this was in the early 30s, they, they said, well, your a delegation from England just came to visit us to get us to disarm. Why? The question is why? And the answer is public sentiment was driven by the British media, which was pro-Hitler. Wow. And honestly, you know, I, I know this is this isn't this is a very touchy subject, but if you actually look at a lot of the of Churchill's memoirs, he believed what drove such tragic loss and destruction was the way that there was a pro-Hitler bias manufactured in the socialist and pro-communist, pro-socialist left media at that time. Henry Luce, who was the father of what's called advocacy journalism, yep. he was the head of Time magazine, put Hitler on the cover, Man of the Year in 1938 of Time magazine. Right. Hitler was building the Autobahn, just like FDR was. So do we really did, did they really have a political problem in World War II, leading up to World War II? Or was it really sentiment driven by the media? I believe if you wow. really look deeper into World War II, the media, had they told the truth about the dangers of socialism, right. the dangers of communism, instead of protecting communists and socialists like Hitler and Stalin, they would have opposed them. We wouldn't have had World War II. Wow. Um, the whole thing is heartbreaking. But, you know, coming, let's bring that forward. 
So here's yeah. Andrew Ross Sorkin. We come forward 70 years. Here's Andrew Ross Sorkin interviewing the head of Chevron. And the head of Chevron is explaining basically very common sense. He's an engineer. He's an intelligent guy, very friendly, explaining that, you know, it's a nice concept to want to get off fossil fuels. Right. But we only have a society like we have because of cheap energy. And, and you know, something I've known for a long time, that the left hates cheap energy. It hates it more than Republicans. It hates it more than Fox News. They hate cheap energy more than every right. Republican in existence. The left hates cheap energy because cheap energy is what allows stability in an advanced civilization amongst the poor, the poorer people. Without if you them. Can, if, if you can destroy the ability of, of the, the, the less, the, the, the people that have the lowest income to be able to survive, if you can drive them right. into complete poverty through expensive food, agriculture and expensive energy fuel, right? Right. You can, you can then play hurt and rescue with that, with that damaged minority and turn them into a voting block, which is what the left does. They manufacture voting blocks based on grievance. But how do they create the grievance? destroy the American economy by driving up energy. And that's the foundational issue um, that, that we, that we look at. Let, okay. Let's take one. Yeah, go on. Sorry. You brought up some great points. Cause my great guest yesterday was uh, George McMillan. And he was saying something that said basically um, that at 40 trillion in debt, hyperinflation kicks in and we are coming approaching that about 10 years earlier than they planned on the left in order to do it intentionally. This fits right into that. And I'm sorry for cutting you off, but no, having, no, having other people say the same things in multiple interviews from multiple experience, your points are spot on. Well, and, and, and I want to go a little deeper into this because let's look at what, let's look at how, what an effect the media has see whoever controls the media controls the fourth unelected branch of government right and it's the most important unelected branch of government or elected government but these right. are for-profit corporations you know when when you when you watch nbc you're not watching a public service you're watching a for-profit entity right that can define how it wants that, that is defining its own competitors if they want to destroy fox for instance or news corp uh they're a competitor to News Corp for ad dollars. So think about this. You have NBC, you know, um, actually, you know, Roger Ailes used to work for NBC when he launched America's Talking for Bob Wright and NBC. And, you know, it, it's an odd reality. You know, people say to me, uh, uh, I was talking to Steve Bannon, you know, about a, couple, about a year and a half ago, and he was talking, sort of bragging a little bit about what he did with Trump. And I said, Steve, Trump is Trump. Trump's a very, very smart communicator. I says, but you know who gets the, tr the credit for creating Trump? And he's, you know, he's, we were arguing and I said, no, no, you, you don't get it. Who gets the credit for creating Trump is NBC. Now, why would you say that? Because they made him a media figure with <laughs> The Apprentice. And then they made him an authority media figure. Now, I want you to think about it. Mark Burnett created a <laughs> show called... Survivor. You remember you remember the TV show called Survivor? Yeah. That was a huge hit. It was a reality show for 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 uh, CBS, right? So Mark Burnett, he eventually married the lady that played Monica on Touched by an Angel, which is one of my wife's favorite shows, and I love that right. show. Too. Very meaningful show, right? Right. Mark Burnett is also a Christian guy, lovely guy, and yeah. he comes up with this idea for The Apprentice, and he gets Donald Trump, uh, who you know is is born and raised an entrepreneur, real estate entrepreneur from Manhattan. Yeah. And he, and he get he convinces NBC to make this guy who was registered I think he was a registered Democrat at that time Trump was right oh yeah into the authority figure in the eyes of the general public and he did this with the Apprentice and he made him authority and and people got to see Donald Trump's logical thinking process and then NBC would shake down like L'Oreal or you know I don't whatever the yep. company uh, Gecko Insurance doesn't matter what it was. They would have, you know, a whole show where they'd be, you know, an infomercial on NBC yep. charging ex extraordinary, you know, huge rates and probably a separate rate for doing an hour infomercial on, on Donald Trump overseeing the brand management of restructuring that brand. 
And then what they did something even more powerful. I was telling this to Steve Bannon. I said, then they did something called the Celebrity Apprentice with Donald Trump. Wasn't that great? Exactly. And so what did they make Donald Trump? They upped Donald Trump's credibility status to being the authority over the celebrities. And celebrities are what define what pop culture is. And pop culture defines what American culture is and what is good or evil in America. Wow. That's a side point. They made Donald Trump the boss of the pop culture crowd. Many of they which were made a huge mis miscalculation. Huge. So NBC is responsible for the first presidential term of Donald Trump because they gave him something <laughs> called media market credibility. They gave him market equity. <laughs> market right? equity. Boom. You're in. Oh, so, so, how fun. So so Steve Bannon looked at me and he, well, I, I don't get it. I said, no. I said, Steve, in the first quarter of 2016, Hillary Clinton spent $300 million in advertising. Yep. Right. In the first quarter of, of that same period, Donald Trump spent $75 million. Now, when you actually analyze the value of of the ratings Donald Trump would be, bring to news broadcasts, right? Because of his market equity, his notoriety, his ability to handle the media. When you turn that, when you turn the value of his ratings power, which is called a rating spike on a TV channel, they're looking right. for a rating spike, like a heartbeat, right? What what happened there? The, the producer for for CBS will go. What happened at twelve minutes after the hour? Oh, that was the Trump interview. We had three times the audience because people were telling their friends and saying, "You got to watch this." Right. Donald Trump got one point two billion dollars in what's called earned media. Earned no media way. is a cash equivalent of what it would cost you to buy media for. But because you got it because of your media strategy right. uh, and you created ratings for uh, the, the companies putting you on, uh, you didn't have to. So Donald Trump, with a seventy five million dollar cash outlay, got a one point two million dollar, a billion dollar media cash equivalent because nbc turned him into an authority figure now that's going to roll into this next election because he's yes. being persecuted how many billions do you think having these uh renegade folks put all these charges against him because his ratings are going through the roof but well, what they, kind of market i'm sorry didn't mean to interrupt i'm sorry this is too cool um uh, the market uh, what kind of numbers do you feel he's going to get for all this press that's going on there? Oh, I think it's a huge boon for him. I, he he understands mm -hmm. how to handle the media. And I wouldn't be surprised. Some of the best minds. Look, a guy like Mark Burnett, who created uh, uh, Survivor and he created right. um, uh, Apprentice. Uh, Roger was Roger. Every time I was in Roger's office and I was in Roger's office about once a month for 15 years. It seemed like every time I was there the last three years. Uh, Trump was always on the phone and I was in the office and I actually went over in 2011, Roger asked me to go over and see Trump. And I actually was I actually created about the originally supposed to be a 15 minute conversation with him because right. at the time, Bob, he Roger was afraid that Bob Wright would sue Roger if he spoke to Trump because Trump was thinking about running for president in 2012. People don't realize this. Right. Oh, wow. And and so he had called Roger to talk about running for president in 2012. And Roger said to me when I was in the office one day, he says, you know, Trump would actually make a really good president. He says, but uh -huh. if I talk to him, Bob Wright at NBC is probably going to try to sue me and Fox for tortious interference with the contract. Because at the time, NBC was still negotiating an extension on Trump's celebrity apprentice contract. And that's a huge amount of money for NBC. Yeah. So so Roger asked me to go over there and I went to see Trump and I spent it was supposed to be 15 minutes and I spent two hours. And at the end of that two hours, because we both have building backgrounds and media backgrounds, uh, Roger said, well, you know, you're a syndicator. Roger tells me all your shows are the top shows on national radio. Uh, <laughs> could you put together because uh, I told him you need to have like a contract with America type outline uh -huh. instead of being against Obama, he needed to be for things right and then let the democrats be against what he's for because republicans are too often framed as being against what the democrats are for you have to frame things in new terms you have to be for something that's innovative and smart and let right. the democrats show that they're really not for things they're really against things right uh and that 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 began nice. an interesting relationship between me and trump he's a wonderful guy i personally think he's a wonderful guy but it's really NBC that gets the credit for building, for making Donald Trump into a major market media player because they made him the authority of the pop culture crowd on the okay. Celebrity Apprentice. 
that whole uh, paradigm, I did not even put two and two together because uh, I'm that is outstandingly cool. But we talk about the um, contract for America or the the Ten Commandments or, or those kind of things. Mark, we're talking about we've you've already established the media, how it's the fourth branch of government. We've also we all know that we're in about ready to hit that. Uh, energy crisis and the only way we're going to make it as a country is if we reduce the prices for energy and protect the farmers because both of those go hand in hand so as you bring this up right into the uh, contract with america what are some of the solutions that we can allude to or i'm trying to say where do you think we ought to go from here well you, you, you've got to understand what's happened. Um, people don't realize, people think radio and TV is dead. It's not dead. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's still about 232 million people that listen to radio every week for an average of 11 to 15 hours a week per person. That's, That's just lot. radio. That's a huge amount. 91% of the American public listen to it every month. Uh, and the time spent listening is massive. You can measure time listening yeah. and viewing on, on, on the internet in, in seconds and in minutes. But you, you got to understand, you're familiar with something called this, the three screen phenomenon. Okay, when you're in your house, the TV's on, your laptop's open, and your cell phone's on, right? Right. When you drive in a car, you are prohibited by law <laughs> from watching TV <laughs> using your cell phone or, you, or, or looking at your laptop. Now, 70% of all talk radio. I've had to stop using putting my lipstick on. I just can't do that anymore. Well, Sorry. and it gets all messy on your mustache. It does. Too. Yeah. I, I look like war paint when I get out of the car. <laughs> Sorry. So 70% 70, 70 of all media, of all talk radio consumption occurs during that time when you're driving, when you're mobile. Yeah. And the longer, and the worse traffic congestion gets, the more you have the time to consume opinions uh, from people like Rush Limbaugh, who is now gone. When Rush Limbaugh passed away, tragically, before his time in my view, the entire talk radio structure in America collapsed because there's very few tentpole shows in national radio. Right. But let's let before we get to that, what Rush did is Rush made 50 million of his audience feel like they weren't crazy. Right. They weren't alone. And in fact, right. they were the majority. Over half of Americans think like. Just basically have common sense. About 60% of Americans have a lot of common sense. Right. right. There's about 5% on the right and the left that on the extremes that are crazy, but most people in right. the middle, they're Americans, right? We have a current, we have a takeover of the totalitarian proto-communists of our media right now. And we've never seen a suppression like this in our lifetimes. If Rush Limbaugh were al alive today. Right. I don't think Twitter and Facebook would have done half the things they did to, to lock down uh, the marketplace of ideas. But because there's nobody like Rush Limbaugh, and, and you could say, well, there's a lot of other hosts who I'm not going to name. I'm right. telling you that most radio hosts and most TV today hosts, no one's developed new talent in radio and television in the last 15 years. Right. Okay. Nobody. And here's what's happened. People like Rush have died off. Roger Ailes is dead. Right. Um, these these are the giants that that were tent, that created tent poles and common sense mediums. Um, they've tried to destroy Trump. They're trying to destroy Trump now. And I, and I, and, and let, let's let's revisit three of if you look at the four allegations against Trump, the four uh, right. actions they can get th three of the four were free speech issues. This is a guy who believes he, the election was stolen from him. Right. right. And their position, when you look at their legal position on this. They're trying to prove he knew that he lost the election and was lying about it knowingly that he had won when he knew he lost. Now, I'm going to tell you, when you look at Joe Biden, I find it hard to believe that 13 million more people voted for Biden than voted for Obama at his height. Right. Uh, Biden is not a very uh, warm character. He's not really interesting. Nobody really knows who he is. Uh, he's grandfatherly, sure enough, back then. But uh, Trump had a wonderful economy. Trump had the lowest lowest interest rates, highest unemployment, highest employment rate for blacks, Hispanics. Yep. When, uh, everything was going great. I would uh, take mean tweets over this 
horrific yeah. dumpster fire we have for a country now. Well, and, and and if you had gone out of your way to destroy this country, you, you couldn't have done it better. You just couldn't have done it better. No. But 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 let's get back to this this issue. If Rush were alive, I don't think right. any of those indictments would have been brought. Not one. Why? Because this is the business Rush was in. Rush was in the free speech business. Roger Ailes was in the free speech business. They actually didn't mind people coming on with varying views, different views. Roger yeah. wanted that. He couldn't get liberal guests in the last five years, six years. He couldn't get them. They had to start hiring professional guests. So the, the thing I want to express is with Rush gone, and then in April, the new Fox management after Roger firing Tucker for no reason to suppress his voice on the wow. Monday following Chuck Schumer coming out and, and calling on the Senate floor for Tucker and Fox and for Murdoch to not allow Tucker to show the video footage of how mm -hmm. that guy with the weird bullhorns was let into the Senate chambers by Capitol Hill police. Chuck Schumer was was screaming like a like a like he had been caught with his handy in the cook hand in the cookie jar. He, that happened Monday the Monday following. You have to think ask yourself. This is almost the same media environment that we had in the thirties, yeah. uh, where there where the with the BBC suppressing Churchill, and with the, with the leftist media in America piling on FDR to not get involved in foreign wars when, when Britain was about to get, you know, it's, it's tail knocked off. Right. You know, we sort of used Britain as a giant aircraft carrier to protect America in a sense, the lend lease right. program, not to go into history. That was how uh, I, uh, FDR sort of figured out a way to, to, to help Britain a little bit, but why, why was, you know, why, why was FDR so constrained? It wasn't, it wasn't by the American people. Yeah. It was by the media. The media defined our pacifist position as America. The media defined England's pacifist position by suppressing Churchill's voice. Right. And what they're doing again is it's a redo. The, these, these four different indictments, nobody thinks that I've known, I've talked to a lot of top legal professionals, no right. one believes that Trump is going to, uh, it, it, that, that any of these things are going to stick. They just want to get uh, uh, um, because they've chosen the venues, for instance, in D.C., 95% of the people in D.C. vote Democrat, okay? Right. A new form of voter uh, voter tampering because they're trying to suggest that if he has a felony conviction, he can't be on the ballot. That's the strategy. Yeah. But, but their hope was, because they have compliant media friends, and I know I'm, I'm not talking about energy, I need to get into energy, but because they had compliant media friends, their hope was, Let's just indict him. Let's reveal the indictment. And in the past, that would have destroyed any political candidate, even one indictment for corruption. Right. Oh, yeah. The problem is, is that they've done it in such an ugly way, in such a clearly disgusting way. It, I'm going to tell you, if they had anything on Trump, don't you think they'd have something stronger than a free speech uh, federal lawsuit against I this guy's free speech? I, I'm going to have guy to say, has had an enema of media and, and, uh, examination. He's had like the, an the, enema the of media examination. That's a t-shirt waiting to happen. Tyrus on Gutfeld cracked me up. He said, uh, Donald Trump is the next, it was our next black president because now that he's been indicted, all the other uh, black guys in his, in his neighborhood are going, Hey, we understand. <laughs> it, 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 so. Exactly. And, and, but this could only happen Stu, in a country that was a post liberal conservative debate society. Right. We, we, we live in a post free speech America right now. And the reason I'm here with you today is to plead with them energy sector, 20 or 30 mid-sized CEOs from mid-sized energy companies to get together right. and to and to re to the only way they're ever going to get a, a, a fair shot with the US media, it's never going to happen ever. The only way they're going to be able to help this country and help their own businesses is by, is be, by becoming the media. Unless the mid-sized oil and gas producers in this country become media savvy really fast, reframe the debate entirely, become heroes to the general public as they are. They are heroes to the general public. Right. We're going to continue seeing corporate communism evolve. 
Corporate communism is what we call ESG, okay? Right. Environmental, social, governmental. That is corporate communism in a different form. It's Marxist beliefs and systems. Yep. It's, it's uh, environmental religious beliefs encapsulated into uh, BlackRock's $10 trillion fund on, on who they will support and who they won't support. And if you are not in lockstep with the ESG belief, let's remove the term ESG and let's call it communist belief. Here's the communist belief system. If you don't, we, BlackRock won't buy your shares. And let, let me illustrate how bad this is. Okay. It, it's less, it, it, the energy sector has suffered from this, but right. we're seeing it revealed in the entertainment sector for the first time ever with Walt Disney Company. The yep. Walt Disney Company uh, was one of my favorite companies. My, one of my heroes is Walt Disney. The way he built his brand, I've studied. I've studied that. Him and Roy Disney. Right. He, was, he was dealing with timeless values uh, and, and overcoming adversity through grace and courage and perseverance. Right. Uh, you know, basically Judeo-Christian values. So, so lo and behold, what do we see starting to happen? We started to see that, that the Walt Disney Company had run out of creative ideas. Uh, after right. the, the 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 great movies of the 2000s, so they had to go on the hunt. They they went and bought Lucasfilm and they went and bought Marvel Entertainment, right. and Marvel Entertainment reflected the values very similar to Disney of Stan Lee. Stan Lee was also very American. I don't know you call him a conservative. We I guess you would call him a conservative now. I guess you'd call Walt Disney a conservative now, if, especially if they're calling Joe Rogan and and Bill Maher conservatives, right? So. <laughs> you know, Tony, to, to think, think about, think about what the, the America of yesteryear was. The America of yesteryear had Bruce Wayne at DC Comics. Yep. He's a billionaire, crime fighter. Tony right. Stark at Marvel, billionaire. billionaire. He's in the military. He builds weapon systems. Uh, but these were aspirational characters. These were the good guys in America. You could become a billionaire. You couldn't be yep. a billionaire in Europe because there's too many laws against it, right? Right. You couldn't be a billionaire in China. America, you can be a billionaire. You can come from China and become a Chinese billionaire in America. Right. right. Uh, so, so you know, Tony Stark and, and Iron Man 3 changed the landscape for filmmaking. And they had a run up yeah. until Endgame with Marvel Comics, where ev Marvel movies, where every movie they would make was a billion dollar hit. And then out comes uh, Endgame and uh, 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 Infinity Wars and Endgame, 2 billion and 2.8 billion. Wow. These those movies, 21 movies, I believe they encapsulated the values of a, the American free enterprise system, conservative traditional values, because a lot of those stories were written in the 60s and 70s. Yep. Right. And and people were wondering, Hollywood was wondering, how is Marvel have 21 movies in a row that make money? Right. Because because the public is mostly conservative and they and it, and it reflects and it validates that aspirational quality of the heroic right. we want to see people that are aspirational characters on the screen we want to see john wayne we want to see tony stark even yep. if tony stark's a narcissist we want to see his transition from narcissist to selfless decent human being right, right. we we want to see steve rogers a skinny 99 pound guy that'll jump on a hand grenade to protect his buddies so what does right. disney yes. do what, what what does disney do bob Iger goes out and he buys marvel entertainment Right. And and he goes out and he buys Lucasfilm from Star Wars. What is Star Wars? Star Wars changed the world culture by encapsulating the hero's journey, which 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 is the, the combination of all the great beliefs, uh, uh, primarily based on Judeo-Christian beliefs, right. uh, but also inclusive of, of all the great heroes of history into right. a 12 step process. Not the, not like the alcoholic thing, but it, there's. In the hero's journey, there's a 12-step process that Luke Skywalker goes through. Right. And in the end, those movies changed a world culture. Because, but, but if you think about it, in, in the third movie, Luke Skywalker uh, yep. saves his father. And, and his father, he says, I have, you know, in the last, in the Return of the Jedi, he says, Father, I have to, you know, I have to show my sister that I've saved you. He says, Luke, you already have. Mm -hmm. You were right about me. You were right about me. I was, you know, underneath he was trapped by the evil, you know, relationship yep. with the emperor. That's a truly Christian story. The, the, I got the story chill. Arc, yeah, I'm sorry. The I, story I, I, arc, 
Yeah. <laughs> the story arc of Star Wars is a redemptive Christian, Judeo Christian, yeah. redempt story of redemption of Darth Vader, right? Yep. Breaking free of the evil of this psychopath that had him under control. And 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 what Darth Vader was trying to say to Luke, he says, You don't need to take my body back. You already saved my soul, basically, by being a better man than me. And it called right. all the little boys in that audience. If their father had failed them to be the better man in the lives of their own fathers, yep, to exemplify to their own fathers through forgiveness, through not giving into hate and grievance, wow. what their fathers could be, and 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 in that in that in that in that story, Darth Vader was one of those failed fathers because America suffers from so much father loss. Eighty-two percent, right of young men are alienated from their fathers in this country 82 percent that that's but the reason why star wars resonated so well is there is that the light side of the force the dark side of the force and then ultimately the redemption of luke of of, of darth vader through the nobility of luke skywalker so mm -hmm. lucas films is bought by disney and disney is then taken over essentially by woke ideology right i watched the marvels last night with my daughter it was the worst crappiest movie i've ever seen in my life they spent 270 million on it it's girl power and i, I have no problem with feminists i have no problem i yeah. have no we're all americans this wasn't a feminist movie this was men are worthless only women are powerful and smart but there's no there's no there's no hero's journey what? in woke characters because woke characters just like uh, Disney made uh, Lucas, the Lucas character, the Ray character in the new Star Wars movie, into this perfect Peggy Sue, where she doesn't have any weaknesses. There's no right. character weaknesses to overcome because these woke people don't have flaws. They're perfect. The storytelling of a Hollywood that has come wow. out of that is that has exported American culture around the world is based on flawed characters overcoming those flaws and becoming more noble, decent creatures. Right. And us like learning the Han, about Han Solo's of the world or the Indiana Joneses of the world. Becoming more mature yes. and, and oh, by overcoming adversity through grace. There's something about that hero's journey that the left innately hates because the hero's journey wow. is one of, of becoming noble from within, which is an a, essentially an American ethos, right? Right. Americans are independent. We we take responsibility when we make a mistake. We say we're sorry. We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, and we try not to repeat the same mistake again. Well, I'm here to tell you, Stu, this country and the world is about to repeat the same mistake again. We're wow. about to repeat all of the evils that happened in World War One and World War II because the oil and gas industry, the agriculture industry, and the other 13 sectors of the industry have been so busy trying to survive in their own business. They right. haven't paid attention to the force that's destroying them, and that's the media. And they, unless they get into the media right now, not a week from now, right now, they, they, can, they can break into buying a sector of it, have influence to be able to tell their side of the story. Right. We're going to have expensive energy in America, and expensive energy ends... Uh, uh, advanced civilizations you have to go back you basically have to spend your time foraging for food and keeping warm and, and guess what when you're spending all your day working three jobs take care a single mom taking care of her kid she pays for daycare she pays for gas which is too much she pays for food which is too much she doesn't even have time to vote and if she votes she'll vote reflexively so how do you do that if you're a leftist and you're ch you're changing the country you want to attack the country there's a lot of ways you can attack the country, but the best way to attack the country is to destroy cheap energy. Because that seed, that creates the seeds for all other type of dissatisfaction and social upheaval. And, and then when, when the grievance comes along, right, it's the media that directs the anger of the grievance. And in this case, the grievance they've created and harvested is environmental fear. You know, Mark... You, you look, you look at Thornburg. What's that girl, Greta Thornburg? Here right. is a girl that's, in my opinion, so terrorized by her parents, or leftists, yeah. right? So terrorized by the peer group she lives in, that she comes out on behalf because she has this internal fear. There's so much anxiety on a child when you tell them that your world is going to end underwater in 12 years, that she comes out passionately, sincerely saying, you've stored my childhood. Well, you know what? 
No, it wasn't fossil fuel that cho- that that stole Greta Thornburg's childhood. It was the crazy ideology. It was her parents of her parents brainwashing her into think that the the, the, the only that the most uh, important source of of civilization that has ever been created, cheap energy, is the enemy. They weaponized her. The communists call that. Uh, the communists call that uh, you know useful idiots. But but I want to get back to this one point about Disney. Disney is an example of a company that now controls 60% of the major theatrical distribution of American culture. Disney, wow. by buying Lucasfilms, by buying Marvel, and by changing all the characters upside down, you don't even recognize Luke Skywalker anymore. You don't recognize uh, the hero. All the heroes are gone. Where's the Steve Rogers the audience rev- resonated with? You know, when you look at box office uh, income, Box office income on the Marvels this last weekend was $47 million, the lowest grossing Marvels movie ever. Wow. Yet 65% of the audience to that was still men. Feminists start showing up to see it. So why do it? And right. the answer is very simple. You do it because you have to attack, you have to attack and retcon all of the things that were so popular that represented American ideals of independence, self-reliance, honesty, integrity, golden rule ethics. You have to re-engineer it all. Um, yeah. and, and now you have Nelson Peltz, who's trying to do a hostile takeover in a sense by getting board seats from Disney because Bob Iger and crew, Kathleen Kennedy, the South Park made a funny thing about the, you know, join the Panderverse. Kathleen Kennedy, <laughs> uh, I'm they, sorry. They, they've I, tried to replace South all Park the male heroes cool. <laughs> with female heroes. Oh, and, and you know why it's funny? Because it's true. It's self-evident truth. It right? is. So, so and and who does Disney own? Disney owns Disney owns ESPN. Yep. Disney owns ABC, right? I know all these. I know a lot of these guys. I've trained a lot of the of, of the on air talent. I've trained a lot of the producers for radio and TV in the United States. A lot of the, I pioneered a lot of wow. that stuff. Uh, interesting stuff. But this is not the media I was in, and this isn't the media that Roger was in. The media you have right now is advocacy media advocacy there is no reporting anymore wow it's it's it and the energy sector for for so mark yeah this is so important that as we roll into this we're going to have a call to action on this mark and i'm i'm going to help uh get this word out there for you with this call to action Let's uh, articulate the last call to action here that we need to do. We already, I get, we already got some great points here of what the next things are going to be that we need. But Mark, your time and your expertise are needed now. We need to get you in front of the energy CEOs. Um, and that is a mission critical thing at this time. Well, here's what I think needs to happen. Um, I have an initiative where I'd like to put about 20 to 30 mid-sized oil and gas producers, CEOs together and create a coalition to create a, mini, a, a media company that essentially promotes uh, the necessity of, of petroleum producers through, the ne- through at least 2050 to right. tell the story of energy. And, and here's the problem energy sector cannot tell the story of the energy sector it can't it's too self-serving it's like you doing a demo on how great you are you can't right so who who can tell this so who can tell the story of the energy sector has to be somebody other than the energy sector right right and here's where i believe here's where i believe we bypass the government we bypass the politicians and we do something really smart you take the money that you're paying the lobbyists that aren't, I don't know who the lobbyists for in the energy sector are right now, but they're not helping a lot. Okay. No. I don't know who the PR firms are that are, that are work for the industry sector, but you know, the energy and mining sectors, extractive energies, industries in general have suffered from the worst representation in the media in history. Many mining companies are at 80 year lows on the Barron's index when adjusted for inflation. Right. Right. Meanwhile, $260 billion has been invested by venture capital firms into environmental companies in the last five years. $260 billion. And the if returns spent, are nothing. If you spent $50 billion getting it, you know, $50 billion, 
sorry. If you even spent $50 million getting into U.S. media, you would have $500 billion worth of impact of earned media impact because you would set the debate, you would frame the debate. And here's the way I believe the debate has to be framed. Okay. I think the energy sector needs to realize that it's that the second biggest sector in America that uses it of the four sectors larger than, than, than automobiles is right. the agriculture sector. Yes. The agriculture sector is being, uh, is being attacked. It's being bought up by the people of, uh, like Bill Gates. Uh, it's being, the, the average farmer is suffering horribly. And you know, the, what's their number one cost, Stu? It's energy. Okay. So let's set aside the corporate farms and let's just look at who really feeds us and makes our food affordable so we don't have to spend all day foraging for food. It's right. the, it's the, it, it, in many cases, it's the family farmer. Right now, right now, the, the worst family far farmers are the minority family farmers, the black farmers. Right. Oddly enough, they're suffering horribly. So what I'd like to do as part of this media project is I'd like to start off by teaching the media sector, the, the energy sector, how to reset the narrative for their own companies. That's that's important. Right. How to become subject matter experts across CNBC, across all the news media. CEOs right. have to learn how to hijack a segment in 60 seconds with impact right. communication. But the way you do that, in my opinion, is you set a fund aside. You take all the money you're paying, your stupid, you know, your mostly useless lobbyists. There's some good ones that are worth their weight in gold, but some of them, many of them are useless and they're just taking money. Uh, and, and the PR firms that you, you meet with a great PR firm, crisis PR firm, and and for an hour, you pay them 100,000, 200,000, a million a month, doesn't matter. They go and give it to a 23-year-old a kid that just graduated from some woke university. That's the quality you're getting. You take that money and you invest in influence by owning part of a media company. I discussed that. But what, what you need to wow. do as a precursor to that is a precursor to that is these 20 or 30 CEOs would get together and create a fund for every family farm in America yep. that is suffering under under this existing administration's horrific eco economy. Right. Give them a year at a time, one year of energy for their farm free of charge. Right. To save their farm. Uh, if you were to take huge. if you were to take one percent of the PR budget of some of the larger major energy companies, right. you could probably save most of the family farms in America just by donating a year's worth of fuel, right? Yep. But but I don't think, you, but, but, but you, gotta, you gotta understand when you're at the size of Exxon and Chevron, which are both great companies, you're, you're more of a politician as a CEO. You're not even a CEO anymore. You're reactive, right? The right. mid-sized oil producers can, can in America can and should tell their story by telling the story of what hero heroism is. Mm -hmm. They're, and, they're and making the truth, 50 to 80 percent of the oil or energy, depending on which way you want to calculate it. It's a huge number. Correct. And and how many if if, if let, let's imagine that this coalition were to create a postcard, a postcard stamp. Right. With three lines on it, three qualifying lines and do a do a media campaign on Twitter, Facebook across the country that says if you're a family farmer and you're having problem because of the existing energy costs, our coalition. No questions asked. We'll give you years worth of free energy to save your farm, and we'll come in. Right. We'll also have our experts come in, and we'll help negotiate deals with the banks to pull you out of foreclosure. Isn't now, that great. Well, why do that? Well, number one, the second biggest sector in the world, besides you know, in the United States especially, is the ag sector. Sector they have very low margins, tiny margins. Right. That one year worth of energy will put them back on their feet. But moreover. That's what Americans do. That's innovation within the the, the, the free enterprise system. Yeah. I'd rather pay. I'd rather I'd rather see, you know, five thousand family farms saved by the energy sector, without government intervention in the next year. Yep. Then then spend that money on expensive PR firms that haven't that have only put the, the energy sector in a toilet. The PR yep. that the, the, the whatever the PR industry is doing, okay, and most of the it ain't PR working. people come from the media sector, and the media guys are leftists, okay. So you're you're paying people. Listen, energy yep. CEOs, you're paying people that hate you. 
Stop paying people that hate you and start paying people that want you to succeed. Number one. Number two, what happens when the energy sector starts saving family farms, saving the family farm in America through its initiatives, through this postcard coming in? Well, the family farmer starts telling energy story to America, not energy. Ag agriculture will, will tell the energy sector story yep. because only agriculture can tell the story of the energy sector saving it. And both are critical for the average American, period. Correct, because one is transportation and the other is food. And in a sense, in order to save America, we have to have cheap energy and cheap food. Energy keeps us warm, allows us to go from here to there. And food, that's how we as human beings, our biological machines, keep us warm and go from here to there. Those are basically the two staples that if you have cheap energy, you have cheap food, guess what happens? You have a chance to rebuild America. America was lost several years ago. This In, in a year, we're going to have a chance to get it back, maybe, maybe. But we live, in a post, we live in a post-freedom America. We live in a post-free speech America. Uh, but we, we, we don't have it anymore. We, we got to act now. I mean, yeah. we cannot act any. We can't act tomorrow. Can't act. We got to act today. Yeah. So, so I mean, you can edit all this up if you want, Stu. I, I, I don't know if I'm giving, giving you good enough uh, material, but, but here's my point. What, why do we need the, the agricultural sector to tell energy story? We need agriculture tech sector to tell energy story because the, whatever the government's doing is killing the family farm. Okay. They're yep. also, it's also trying to kill energy. What's the first thing that Biden did in his first week? I think he oh. sh shut down the XL pipeline. He yep. started going at, so, so for what reason? So that we can, uh, what? So that we can start buying energy from a communist dictator in Venezuela who was on his way out. So we can, so we can uh, uh, you know, drive up the value per barrel of Putin's energy so he can subsidize his war with Ukraine. Cheap energy in America under Trump was what was killing the international markets, keeping yeah. prices down so that Hamas and Hezbollah couldn't be funded, and, so that Putin you, couldn't and, afford to go to war. And when you take a look at Trump versus Biden, under Trump, there were 400 and, uh, 350 uh, million barrels per day, uh, 1,000 barrels per day, and Iran was producing. They're now at 3.7 million barrels per day. So under Trump, they were at 350,000. Now they're, in, you know, they're up to over the 3 million barrels per day. That's nuts. Well, That's well, because I of... of Anyway. I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you what, if, if South Park, see, you got to understand something. South Park will attack Disney because it's so openly woke, right? It's, it's, right? it's movies are bombing because it's high profile. Right. The energy sector is, why isn't the energy sector as high profile as Disney? It's not. It's invisible because most people don't know about it. Most right. people don't know about it because, because nobody on in the energy sector has paid attention to being in the media to give an opposing viewpoint or to they even... Have you, they have not you, defended in themselves. The energy sector, you have given the debate to the left by default. You've just given them, you've ceded all public policy to the left, period. I want you to think about sentiment. What is sentiment? What drives sentiment, right? right. How can Andrew Ross Sorkin feel so comfortable basically telling the head of Chevron that he is like a dealer of cancer, okay? Right. I mean... It, he should be like thanking him for cheap energy, but he's not. He's because there's so much the sentiment has been reinforced so much. Right. That it's a given that energy's evil. Let me tell you, with expensive energy, we have a collapse of civilization. There it's it's over, right? So you know, guys, look at look at look at the war that's happened. The war on energy has almost already been won in America by the bad guys. Now it's the, the, the attacks on the ag sector, that's ongoing. The mm -hmm. most obvious war is through Disney. Why is BlackRock supporting Disney so much? Look at the board of Disney. The board of Disney is a bunch of people that don't understand entertainment. Right. And I want you to think about it. Disney is an entertainment company for children, right? Why what, did somebody wake up one morning and say, hey, maybe it's a good idea to talk about sexuality with children in Disney shows? Yep. 
And somebody on the board must have said, well, hey, Mark or whoever, Bob Iger, you know, don't you think since like 60 percent of the country is pretty conservative that will alienate 60 percent of our car customers? Right. Oh, no, that won't happen. That won't happen. Oops. Let me tell you, if Walt Disney was alive, he would say you, you don't talk about heterosexuality, homosexuality. Don't talk about any of it. Right. Okay, leave it alone. R Ronald Reagan had no issues with gays. I have no issues with gays. I don't either. It, I, it, I don't care what people do in their bed. It's none of my business. Just don't sell it to me like it's a, like a superior lifestyle. Like if you're not gay, you're 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 like out. Okay. You're right. you know just make it normal. So South Park comes along and they do this thing called Join the Panderverse, and in it they have Kathleen Kennedy of Lucasfilm, you know Cartman in a in a wig saying you know what what, what did he do in that show? He repeated the same thing. Ask Kathleen Kennedy. He says put a chick in it, make a gay and lame. It was like really hysterically funny right satire they're blaming He's, south park for the worst opening ever on marvel movies disney's blaming south park for this so you got to blame somebody and i'll tell you what i i would never want to be on the wrong end of the guys at south park uh so, you, well, well well guys <laughs> th th think about this if they can attack american american cultural belief through redefining star wars as a leftist thing when it was normally an american Basically, right. Luke Skywalker, and, and Luke Skywalker was the was the was the basic archetypal hero, but very much in the American uh, ethos of of the hero's journey, right? Right. Uh, to, you know, Tony Stark, uh, uh, Thor. If you look at this, you know, the, the Thor story of the original Thor movie, he was a selfish, narcissistic, you know, sort of demigod, and then he goes down to Earth and he's willing to lay down his life for his friends. This is the right. he, hero's journey once again. Huge box office. Suddenly, uh, Bob Iger, Disney takes it over and they rework all the Marvel heroes into leftist woke stuff that all the characters are, you know, don't have flaws because if yeah. you're a leftist, you don't have any flaws. You don't have any character weaknesses. You're perfect. Right. Uh, they, they rework this. They, they make Mark Hamill into an angry hermit on an island drinking blue milk out of some weird looking sea cow. It was one of the grossest thing I've ever seen with those in your series. But you need to understand what this really is. It's an attack on the traditional American America that we grew up with. Right. Very. And, and, and this attack on culture, which is very obvious is so obvious that when Disney starts, when Disney loses money on the last nine of the last 10 movies, because the public doesn't want it, the producers at Disney attack the public. Right. Yep. So I want you guys to understand. Uh, energy has already lost. It's already over for you guys. You want to get your you want to get back. You want to get to have a chance to get it back in America. You need to become the media right now. I could show you how to do it. I understand exactly how they do it. I understand it like a liberal. I'm right. one of the few people you can call conservatives that actually thinks like a liberal when it comes to distribution and positioning. I actually I understand all I, of what they do. And I, I don't hate them. I think they're geniuses in the way they position. But why conservatives don't pay attention not even conservatives. Why just business people seed the media, the narrative to their enemies and then wonder why they've been put out of business by public policy. Wonder why uh, weird politicians get in that are crazy. They're just wow. crazy. Look, look at this guy from Pennsylvania. He can't talk. What's, what's his name? He's the, he's the tall guy that wore the hoodie at the Senate. Remember? That? Oh, um, uh, Fetterman. Fetterman. So here's a guy goes up against Oz, who's the Republican. Fetterman can't speak. Okay. God bless him for, you know, I understand what it, he had a stroke. I get it. I mean, I, I understand. I have compassion for that. I, I, I get it, but he's not qualified to be a U.S. Senator. He looks like a, a he looks like um, you'd see him outside of like a biker bar with topless hookers on a Friday night as the bouncer. That's what he looks like. Uh, yes. Obviously some, somebody said, you know what? We don't need, we control so much of the media. We're going to get that guy elected. What, what, that was what a bet. Guy, Somebody lost a better. bet and had to <laughs> get Fetterman. Some DNC <laughs> top guy says, you know, come, John, come over here. Come over here. What, 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 what do you want, boss? What do you want, boss? <laughs> you want to be senator? Don, yeah, let me, I'm trying to get a dollar bill out so I can do it out of trading places. Come yeah. on. <laughs> exactly. And, and he says, well, how can I run? I can't even speak. I don't even know. I've born a trust baby. I, well, you're, yeah. you're a good, you're a good bouncer, aren't you? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I protect the girls, you know. Are you breathing? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm breathing, yeah. Well, you see, John, you don't really need to speak. 
well, why? It's a center. No, no, you, we'll tell you what to vote for. Here's the deal. We own the media. We also, we also own the people that count the votes. So what we're going to do is we're going to use you as a cautionary tale. If any of the Democratic candidates, Democratic candidates that run for office anywhere get an idea they're going to do the Robert Kennedy thing, be independent right. thinkers, we're just going to say, look, we can do, we put that guy that can't talk, that looks like a bouncer, and we made him a U.S. senator. We even changed the rules so he can wear a hoodie and shorts on the U.S. Senate. You want to go up against us? Nope. The, the, the yeah. Democratic Party we have today is a post-Democratic Party. The Democratic Party we have of today is the Communist Party of the 1970s. The Republican Party we have of today is the Democratic Party of the 1970s. Right. When and, I, and, I, and, and, and Trump when I was... and DeSantis represents the, the Reagan ethos. Yep. They're the only ones that still sort of represent the Reagan ethos. You know, you got the Republicans that you have the turtle, Mitch McConnell, like, you know, I, they call him the turtle. He's, I mean, basically that's a Democrat. He earned that one, I got to admit. Uh, yeah. But, you know, uh, back when I was helping uh, the legislature in Oklahoma, you couldn't tell the difference between a Democrat and a Republican because everybody cared about, uh, you know, what was happening for the, the, the country and the people. But, you know, Mark, I, I am so excited to get you in front of the energy CEOs, the energy teams, the energy and the farmers, because this story has to get out. One last well, word it, here, Mark, give me, give us your last word. We had about two minutes. So let us know okay. what your last thoughts are. Okay. So here's what, here's my last thoughts. 30, 20 or 30 energy CEOs need to create a coalition that starts or buys an existing media network tv radio doesn't matter right um i i think radio i think talk i think they need to we need to start a star, star search to find the next rush limbaugh the next tucker carlson and that's something i also have in mind to do which which american idol revitalized america the american music industry i want to do and i'm going to do an american idol star, type star search for the next giant talk host nice. and it'll be a giant international contest uh, where the top 30 will be voted on every week and then the top two will be syndicated by yours truly. But I also want to start something that's a base load energy channel, not just a channel, but more than a channel that includes public relations. It, incru it, incru it includes documentaries, scripted dramas, you name it, and try to retake a position in the mind of the American public that's been lost. The, the wow. way you do that is you save the small farmer. The energy sector saves the small farmer without government intervention, just transferring some of its dollars from PR and lobbying over to saving family farmers. And right. those family farmers will tell the story of how energy saved them. And guess what? If the agriculture sector and the family farmer tells the stories of the generosity and the heroism of American energy saving them, right. um, guess who can tell the story of agriculture? The story of agriculture can only be told by the energy sector. So the energy sector can tell agriculture's story of suffering and woe. Right. And the agriculture sector can tell the energy sector's story of heroism and being the benefactor of agriculture. Those two sectors need to fall in love and get married right now. I love it. Energy needs to fall in love and marry the U.S. small farmer. Not, I'm not saying the big corporate thing, farms. But cheap food is cheap food. That's fine. I don't care. Those two together need to unify right. and change overall consensus. And then guess what we'll do with that media company? Who will be our future senator and, and, and congressional congressman, uh, congressional uh, candidates for state and local office? The small farmers, the energy sector saved. And we'll teach them how to, to, to do stump speeches. We'll teach them how to hijack segments on TV shows and create rating spikes. We right. will, and we'll also go into conservative Hollywood and find the top 2,000, which I know, I've got a list of them, the top 2,000 conservative Hollywood actors who just like Donald Trump have market equity, right? Right. There are people like Tom Selleck out there that if they ran for governor, they'd win. Yes. Okay? Why? For the same reason NBC made Tom, Donald Trump, they gave him a platform, they made him, they gave him market equity that creates earned media. There's 2,000 conservative actors out there and, you know, I'm not aware of one single one, starting with, uh, what's his name, 
um, Scooter from Love Boat. He ran for Congress and won. Sonny Bono ran for Congress and won. Donald Trump ran for Congress and run. He was a TV star. Ronald Reagan had 15, was a syndicated talk show host in 1976. 1,500 stations nationwide. He ran for office and won. You have to have market equity by being a media figure before you can ever run for office. And we can create the next generation of media figures. And from that, create market equity for them to create the next generation of state and local federal elected officials to refashion energy policy and ag policy in this country to keep energy low and food low. So the average lowest income earner can afford to have a life beyond just sufficient keeping warm and eating. Okay. But that starts with the energy sector realizing the ag sector don't have the money to do it. You guys do. And you've already lost. So if you want to start winning, and I know how to make you help you win. Roger Ailes knew how to make people win. He's gone. Andrew Breitbart, good friend of mine, Breitbart.com. He's not around anymore. I'm one of the few dinosaurs left that knows how to do this because I think like a liberal when it comes to distribution and strategy. But I have you know, I have Judeo-Christian values. And I think the energy sector could save America right I now because so America's already been lost. We live in a post-America right now. Right. We got to do something. You don't have time left. Your lobbyists aren't doing anything for you. Whatever those lobbyists are doing. Right. They ain't. Why don't you use that money that you're paying these PR firms and these lobbying firms? And we'll put together a company that can reframe the entire debate. Right. Because I'll tell you what, within weeks of that initiative going everywhere, the American public will see, will, will get behind the, the, these 30 companies. Uh, offering that year's worth of free energy assistance to small farmers they'll get you you will have you won't even the american public will jump in and start paying off mortgages for every small farmer in america without the energy sector having to ask and uh the goodness of the the anti-bud crowd movement people will be buying your products and investing in your company the correct two and three fold second order magnitude is positive well think about it uh, the ESG excluding energy companies from uh, ETFs. If 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 it if it, if an energy media company became that popular, wouldn't those Amer- wouldn't 175 million Americans seek out the 30 CEOs behind such a media venture and want to find out whose company they run and mm-hmm. reward that company? You know, when when Rush Limbaugh, I, I'm just going to close with this thought. <laughs> to show you how powerful a voice is that speaks on your behalf in an intelligent, lighthearted way. Not heavy, lighthearted in the way Rush did, in the way Reagan did, did. Okay. Reagan had that victory attitude where he'd communicate good points, but he'd always have a light point. Mark, thank you very much for stopping by the podcast. I mean, I had an absolute blast. Thank you. And I cannot wait to talk to you again. Mm-hmm.